Parisians entered the First World War 1914 in August 1914 on a wave of patriotic fervor, but within a few weeks Paris was close to the front lines and bombarded by German aircraft and artillery. The Parisians endured food shortages, rationing, and an epidemic of influenza, but morale remained high until near the end of the war. With the departure of young men to the front lines, women took a much greater place in the workforce. The city also saw a large influx of immigrants who came to work in the defense factories. The end of the war on November 11, 1918 saw huge celebrations on the boulevards of Paris. <laughs> Paris mobilizers On June 28, 1914, the news reached Paris of the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria by Serbian nationalists in Sarajevo. Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia on July 28, and following the terms of their alliances, the German Empire joined Austria-Hungary, while Russia, Great Britain and France went to war against Austria-Hungary and Germany in quick succession. The war was opposed by some prominent socialists and pacifists, but the press and most political leaders pressed for war. On July 31, one day before a general mobilization was declared in France, one of the most prominent leaders of the French left, the socialist politician Jean Jaillers, an outspoken opponent of going to war, was assassinated at the Café Croissant on Montmartre, not far from the offices of the socialist newspaper Luminite, by Raoul Villain, a mentally unstable man who considered Jaillers an enemy of France. Most male Parisians of military age were required to report on August 2 to designated stations around the city for mobilization into the army. The army command expected that up to 13% would not appear, but to their surprise all but 1% appeared as ordered. The poet and novelist Anatoly France, at the age of 70, appeared at the recruitment station to show his support. The Ministry of the Interior was prepared to arrest prominent pacifists and socialists who opposed the war, but, in the face of little opposition to the war, the arrests were never carried out. The next day, August 3, Germany declared war on France. <laughs> Paris on the front lines The outbreak of the First World War in August 1914 saw patriotic demonstrations on the Place de la Concorde and at the Gare de Lay and Gare du Nord as the mobilized soldiers departed for the front. But while the Paris newspapers were confident of a quick victory, the German army swept through Belgium and marched rapidly toward Paris. On 26 August, trainloads of refugees from Belgium arrived at the Gare du Nord and were given shelter at the Cirque de Paris. On 30 August, a German plane appeared over Paris and dropped three bombs, one on the Rue des Recollets, one on the Quai de Valmy and the third on the Rue des Vinaigres. The last bomb killed an elderly woman and wounded three persons. City authorities did not allow the casualties to be mentioned in the press. Another plane appeared on August 31 to drop a message with the claim that the Germans had defeated the French army at Saint Quentin, and a third plane appeared on September, one this time to drop more bombs that killed one person and injured 16. These casualties were also concealed from the public. On August 26, the same day that the refugees from Belgium began arriving in the city, General Joseph Galliani was called from retirement and appointed military governor of Paris, a title that dated back to the 14th century. He quickly began organizing the defenses of the city. The forts around the city were prepared for action. 376 cannons and batteries of new 75 mm guns were placed around the city to defend it against aerial attack, and machine guns and a cannon were placed on the Eiffel Tower. Herds of cattle were brought into the city to provide meat in the event of a long siege. The important masterpieces of the Louvre were transported to Toulouse for safekeeping. As the German army drew closer, French President Raymond Poincaré decided to move the French government and the National Assembly to safety in Bordeaux, as had been done in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870–71. On September 2, posters appeared around the city announcing that, "...the members of the government of the Republic have left Paris to give a new impulse to the national defence." 
By the first week of September, the Germans had come within 30 km of the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris. The French and British armies were engaged in fierce fighting with the Germans in the First Battle of the Marne. When one of the German armies turned southeast to attack the French army on the flank, it opened a gap between the German armies, and the French forces, led by Maréchal Joffre, saw an opportunity to attack them on their own flank. General Galliani decided to send all of his reserves from Paris to the front to aid the attack, but lacked enough trains and omnibuses to move the soldiers. On September 5, Galliani requisitioned a thousand private vehicles, including about 600 Paris taxicabs and their drivers to carry soldiers to the front at nantoila hordouin 50 km away. The drivers were assembled on the evening of September 6 on the Esplanade of Les Invalides. They were mostly the Renault AG1 Landorlet model, with an average speed of 25 km per hour 16 miles per hour. Within 24 hours, the Vilmumbel and Gagny battalions, about 6,000 soldiers and officers, were moved to the front at Nantoila Hordouin. Each taxi carried five soldiers, four in the back and one next to the driver. Only the back lights of the taxis were lit, the drivers were instructed to follow the lights of the taxi ahead. Most of the taxis were demobilized on September 8, but some remained longer to carry the wounded and refugees. The taxis, following city regulations, dutifully ran their meters. The French Treasury reimbursed the total fare of 70,012 francs. The Germans were surprised and pushed back by the French and British armies. The number of soldiers transported by taxi was small compared to the huge armies engaged in the battle, and the military impact was minor, but the effect on French morale was enormous. It demonstrated the solidarity between the people and the army. Fearing a long siege, General Galliani did what he could to reduce the number of Parisians who needed to be fed. A dozen free trains were organized on 5 September to take Parisians to the French provinces. An emergency census ordered by Galliani on September 8 showed that the population of Paris had dropped to 1,800,000, or only 63% of the population counted in 1911. By October, public transportation was again running in the city. The military government declared a moratorium on rents for those Parisians who had been summoned into the army and protected them from legal action until the end of the war. As of December 20, pedestrians could walk freely in Paris once again, but vehicles were only allowed to enter and leave Paris by 14 of the 55 city gates that were open from 5 in the morning until 10 at night. The government returned to Paris on December 11, and President Poincaré was again able to meet with his Council of Ministers in the Élysée Palace. The front lines moved further north, and by 4 January 1915, Paris was no longer considered to be threatened. Nonetheless, the city was bombed by a German Zeppelin airship on March 21, 1915, and by German planes on May 11 and May 22. <laughs> Daily life The Parisians gradually adjusted to the life of a city at war. Avenue de l'Allemagne was renamed Avenue Jean Jaillers, and the Rue de Berlin became the Rue de Liege. The Grand Palais was converted to a military hospital. After a brief interruption, the theatres of Paris reopened, presenting plays with patriotic themes, and the café's concerts, which offered music, food and dancing, were crowded. As it became evident that the war would be long, the government began to take over the system of food distribution in the city. A law of October 1915 allowed the state to requisition wheat and other grains at a price fixed by the government. In 1916, the controls were extended to milk, sugar and eggs. A Ministry of Food Supply was created in 1917 to better control the distribution, and to tax the food products to limit consumption. In May 1916, sugar was taxed at 1.3 francs per kilo, while margarine, which had largely replaced extremely scarce butter, was taxed from 2.70 to 3.10 francs per kilo. A standard loaf of bread, called the Pain National, National Bread was introduced in June 29, 1916, it was made with a more rustic flour than the traditional Parisian white loaf. 
Restrictions were tightened even further on February 25, 1917, with the requirement that only a single type of loaf of bread could be sold. It weighed 700 grams, was 80 cm long, and was sold 24 hours after it was baked. Special breads and brioches were forbidden. Other food staples were also rationed. The municipal council provided a ration of 135 grams of potatoes per day per person to poor families. Reliable sources of electricity and heat for the city population was another urgent need. The major coal mines of northern France were to the north behind the German lines. The problem was especially urgent during the bitterly cold winter of 1916 17, when temperatures fell to 7 degrees below zero Celsius. The municipality reserved supplies of coal for the elderly, the unemployed, and the families of mobilized soldiers. They were permitted a 50 kg sack of coal every 40 days for a payment of 4.75 francs. Shortages of coal also limited the generation of electricity, and sometimes the tram lines could not operate for lack of power. As men were drafted into the army, women frequently took their place, first as teachers and ticket clerks on the metro and tramways, then for factory working. By 1916, they were driving streetcars. On June 1, 1917, the first women mail carriers began delivering letters in the 10th and 17th arrondissements. Parisian fashions were modified for the benefit of working women, skirts were made shorter, and corsets were made less tight. New words entered the French language a factrice for a woman postman, a conductrice for a woman tram driver, and a munitionette for a woman working in a munitions factory. The first business school for women, the École de Hort Enseignement Commercial, opened on December 2, 1915. While the government stressed efficiency and the maximization of supplies for the army, the working class was largely committed to a traditional sense of consumer rights, whereby it was the duty of the government to provide the basic food, housing and fuel for the city. There was also a sense that hoarding and profiteering were evils that citizens should organize to combat. Industrial Paris Since the coal mines and major industrial cities of the north were behind German lines, the government was forced to reorganize the industry of Paris to provide the enormous quantities of weapons and ammunition that the army needed. The munitions factories of Paris had to produce 100,075mm artillery shells every day, in addition to other munitions, cannon, rifles, trucks, ambulances, and aircraft, as well as building the machine tools and factory equipment needed to expand production. The effort was led by Albert Thomas, a socialist politician who became the Secretary of State for Artillery. In 1915, more than a thousand Paris enterprises were working in the sector of national defense. Most of the defense factories were located in the outer neighborhoods of the city, particularly the 13th, 14th, 15th and 18th arrondissements. A large Citroën factory was built at Javel, and the Renault factory at boulogne billancourt was converted from making automobiles to making a revolutionary new weapon, the tank. The aviation firm Blériot Aeronautique built an enormous aircraft factory in 1917 that covered 28,000 square meters at Seren. The traditional small workshops of French industry were reorganized into huge assembly lines following the model of factory of Henry Ford in the United States and the productivity studies of Frederick Taylor on scientific management. As factory workers were drafted and sent to the front, their places were taken by women as well as 183,000 colonials from French Africa and Indochina who were closely watched by the government. On August 27, 1915, 1,700 Chinese workers arrived at the Gare de Lyon to take positions in the Renault tank factory and other defense works. The work in the defense factories was intense and dangerous, as inexperienced workers handled dangerous chemicals and high explosives. On October 20, 1915, a workshop making hand grenades at 173 rue de Tolbiac exploded, killing about 50 workers and injuring a hundred. In April 1918, a new factory in Vincennes making shells and mustard gas exploded, poisoning 310 workers. <laughs> Discontent and strikes 
For the first three years of the war, all classes and political parties generally gave their support to the war effort and the soldiers at the front, a consensus referred to as the Union Sacre. However, in the spring of 1917, Paris workers began to demand more compensation for their efforts. The cost of living in Paris rose by 20% in 1915, 35% in 1916, and 120% between 1917 and the end of the war in November 1918. The salaries of factory workers increased only 75% during the same period, whereas the salaries of government employees rose by only 50%. Workers began to demand higher wages, better conditions for women workers, and an end to the importation of foreign workers. The first strike, by 2,000 women clothing workers, known as Midinets, began on May 15, 1917. They demanded a salary increase of one franc a day and a five day week, referred to as an English week. The strike spread to other trades, and 10,000 Midinets gathered outside the labor exchange. Negotiators from the clothing industry agreed to an increase of 75 centimes a day and a five-day week, but this concession was rejected by the Association of Employers. The Midinets marched to the National Assembly, and on May 23, the employers agreed to raise their wages by one franc a day and to give them a five-day week. The success of the Midinets inspired workers in other industries, the women employees of the Printom department store and the banks promptly went on strike. The strikes spread to florists, box makers, rubber workers, women serving in restaurants, laundry workers, the employees of the Kodak factory, and other enterprises. By May 29, the strike spread to the workers of the Orleans Railway and the Gare d'Austerlitz, employees of the savings banks, and workers at the armaments factories of Samson and Renault. Beginning on June 2, the strikes receded when the industries largely granted the demands. Some of the strike leaders were arrested and imprisoned for hindering the war effort. Espionage <inaudible> As the command centre of the French military and the French economy, Paris was a priority target for German espionage. The most famous spy was a Dutch citizen named Margareta Zell, better known as Marta Hari. Born in the Netherlands, she moved to Paris in 1903 and became first a circus horseback rider, then an exotic dancer, then a courtesan as the mistress of a prominent Lyon industrialist, Emile Etienne Guimet, the founder of the Musée Guimet of Asian Art in Paris. When the war began, she became part of an espionage network directed from the German embassy in Madrid, which she visited frequently. French intelligence suspected her because of her travels to Spain. They intercepted messages from the German embassy in Madrid mentioning an agent H-21. By giving her false military information, the French were able to confirm that Marta Hari was H-21. She was arrested on February 13, 1917, at the Hotel Elysee Palace, then tried and convicted of espionage on July 24. At dawn on October 15, 1917, she was taken to the moat of the Chateau of Vincennes and executed by a firing squad. <laughs> Art and culture The war limited, but did not stop, the cultural output of the painters and artists of the city. The artistic centre shifted from Montmartre to the neighbourhood of Montparnasse, around the cafés La Dôme, La Coupole, Rotonde, and La Select. Pablo Picasso, one of those who moved to Montparnasse, was not required to go into the army as a citizen of neutral Spain, and he continued to experiment with the new style of Cubism. Henri Matisse continued to work at his studio on the Rue de Fleurus until he moved to Chimis, near Nice, in 1917. Other artists who lived in Montparnasse included André Durain who joined the army and served through the entire war, Juan Gris, Max Jacob, and Amadeo Modigliani, Jean Cocteau served in the Red Cross as an ambulance driver. In Montparnasse, he met the poet Guillaume Apollinaire, artists Pablo Picasso and Amadeo Modigliani, and numerous other writers and artists with whom he later collaborated. The avant-garde dance troupe Les Ballets Russes was stranded in Paris thanks to the war and the Russian Revolution. 
The Russian impresario Sergei Diahilev persuaded Cocteau to write a scenario for a ballet, which resulted in Parade in 1917. It was produced by Diahilev with sets by Picasso and music by Eric Satie. It was first performed in Paris on May 18, 1917. Marcel Proust, in fragile health, spent the war inside his house at 102 Boulevard Haussmann working on the second volume of his novel In Search of Lost Time. Other Paris artists took part in the war, the poet Guillaume Apollinaire, for example, went into the army and was seriously wounded in 1916. While recovering in Paris, he wrote Les Mammals de Thérésius and coined the word surrealism in the program notes for Jean Cocteau and Eric Satie's Ballet Parade. He also published an artistic manifesto, L'Esprit Nouveau et les Poétesse. The war weakened Apollinaire died of influenza during the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 and was interred in the Perry Lachaise Cemetery. Both Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel, the most prominent French composers of the 1910s, were deeply distressed by the events of World War I. Debussy was already quite ill at the start of the war and unable to contribute to the war effort. His last compositions were written in Paris before his death on March 25, 1918, only a half year before the war ended. Ravel attempted to enlist in the Air Force at the start of the war, but was found physically unfit and served instead as a truck driver. The most significant French composition written during World War I was Ravel's Le Tombeau de Couperin, completed in 1917. In its original form as a piano suite it was later orchestrated, each of the movements was dedicated to a French officer who lost his life in the war. <laughs> Paris again on the front lines By 1917, France was nearly exhausted by the war, and mutinies broke out among some soldiers at the front. On April 6, 1917, the Paris newspapers reported the welcome news that the United States, provoked by submarine attacks against U.S. ships, had declared war on Germany. The first American soldiers arrived on June 29, 1917, but their numbers were small, and it took nearly a year to train and prepare a large U.S. Army. By the spring of 1918, 10,000 U.S. soldiers a month were arriving in France. The Treaty of Brest Litovsk of March 1918 had taken Russia out of the war. Germany moved its armies west and launched a huge new offensive against France, hoping to end the war quickly before the Americans could change the balance of the war. In November 1917, Georges Clemenceau of the Radical Party became the new Prime Minister of France. He had been a fierce opponent of the government and now became an even more fierce proponent of carrying the war to victory. His often repeated slogan was La guerre jusqu'au bout, war until the end. He resided in an apartment on Rue Benjamin Franklin and conducted the war not from the Prime Minister's traditional residence at the Hotel Matignon, but from the Ministry of War on Rue Saint Dominique. He made frequent visits to the front, close to the German lines, to encourage the ordinary soldiers. Paris once again became a target for German bombardment aimed at demoralizing the Parisians. On January 30, four squadrons of seven German Gotha bombers each appeared over the city and suburbs to drop 200 bombs. There were more attacks on March 8 than March 11. The attacks took place at night, and Parisians took sanctuary in the metro stations. During a new attack on the night of March 11–12, a panic took place in the crowded Bolivar metro station that caused the deaths of 70 civilians. On March 21, 1918, the Germans launched a major new offensive, hoping to end the war before the bulk of American forces arrived, they attacked through a gap between the British and French armies and headed directly toward Paris. On March 23, the Germans introduced a new weapon to terrorize the Parisians, the long-ranged Paris gun. It could fire shells 120 km into the heart of the city. 303 huge shells were lobbed into the city. On March 29, 1918, one shell struck the St. Gervais Church, killing 88 persons. 256 Parisians were killed and 629 were wounded by German shells. Another enemy struck Paris in the spring of 1918, even deadlier than the German artillery, an epidemic of the Spanish influenza. 
At the peak of the epidemic, in October 1918, 1,769 Parisians died, including the writers Guillaume Apollinaire and Edmund Rostand. By July 14, 1918, the new German offensive had reached Château Thierry, only 70 km from Paris. The city was put back under military government. The bombardments of the city intensified, works of art were once again evacuated from the Louvre, sandbags were placed around monuments, and the street lights were turned off at 10 in the evening to hide the city from German night bombers. To resist the Germans more effectively, Clemenceau insisted that the French, British and American armies be under a single commander, Marshal Ferdinand Foch. Large numbers of American soldiers arrived in France every month, while German resources and manpower were nearly exhausted. The German offensive was turned back by an Allied counter-offensive on July 21, and the threat to Paris lifted again. The end of the war and celebration By November, the Germans and their allies were unable to continue the war. The Austro-Hungarian monarchy collapsed on November 3, then the German monarchy on November 9. Germany was proclaimed a republic, and the German Emperor Wilhelm II fled to the Netherlands. The new German government sent a delegation to Compiègne, north of Paris, and the armistice was signed at 5 a.m. on November 11, 1918. The day was described by the French historian René Heron de Villefos, who was a young student in a Paris college. At 11 o'clock, in the fog, the church bells announced the armistice. The college released its students class by class, and they rushed to the Champs-Élysées and the Place de la Concorde, where there were displays of trench mortars and small cannon recently captured from the enemy. The students of philosophy returned, dragging these trophies, including a captured flag, with them. In the afternoon, on the Grand Boulevards, the enthusiasm of the crowd was indescribable. People shouted, kissed, blew on trumpets, and blew the horns of trucks surrounded by the crowds. Any soldier encountered was embraced and carried in triumph. We poor students of rhetoric gave more kisses than we had exchanged during the entire past year. The lights came back on during the evening, and the buses began running again. We sang, we danced, and we made parades for days afterwards. Equally enthusiastic crowds filled the Champs Elysees on the 17th of November to celebrate the return of Alsace and Lorraine to France. Huge crowds also welcomed President Woodrow Wilson to the Hotel de Ville on 16 December 1918, when he arrived to take part in the peace negotiations at Versailles. <laughs> Chronology 1914 the 28th of June, assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria by Serbian nationalists in Sarajevo, the catalyst for the beginning of World War One. The 28th of July, a declaration of war on Serbia by Austria-Hungary marks the beginning of World War One. The 31st of July, Jean Jaurès, leader of the French Socialists, assassinated by a mentally disturbed man in the Café du Croissant on the Rue du Croissant in Montmartre. 1 August – Mobilization of French Army reservists. 3 August – Germany declares war on France. 29 August – The French government and National Assembly depart Paris for Bordeaux. September 6–9 The army requisitions 600 1,000 Paris taxis to transport 6,000 soldiers 50 km to the front lines in the First Battle of the Marne. December 9 – The Government and National Assembly returned to Paris. El Agedrasista Automaton introduced at the University of Paris. 1915 10 September – The satirical magazine Canard en Chain begins publication. 30 October – Official prices of food are posted on the doorways of public schools to deter profiteering. 1916 the 20th of January, frozen meat goes on sale in two Paris butcher shops. The 29th of January, the first bombing of Paris by a German Zeppelin, 26 persons are killed and 32 wounded at Belleville. 
The 27th of August 1700 Chinese workers arrive at the Gare de Lyon to work in Paris armaments factories replacing men mobilized into the army. The 15th of December the first woman conductor is hired for the Paris tramways. The Renault factory at boulogne billancourt begins manufacturing the first French tanks. 1917 The 9th of February shortage of coal and grain. Bakers are permitted to sell only one kind of bread, to be sold the day after it is baked. The 15th of May, wave of strikes in Paris workshops and factories with workers' demands for a five-day week and an extra franc a day to compensate for higher prices. Most demands are granted. The 1st of September, rationing of coal begins. The 25th of November, seats are reserved on Paris public transportation for the blind and those wounded in the war. 15 October – Execution by firing squad of the Dutch native Marta Hari, a spy for the Germans, in the moat of the Château de Vincennes 1918 29 January – Rationing of bread is imposed, a card allows 300 grams per day per person 30 January – Night bombing raid by 28 German aircraft kills 65 persons and injures 200. Further raids take place on March 8 and 11. The 11th of March, German bombing raid causes a panic in the Bolivar metro station, killing 71 persons. The 21st of March, German long-range artillery fires 18 shells into Paris, killing 15 and wounding 69. The shelling continues until the 16th of September. The 29th of March, a German shell hits the Saint Gervais church during mass, killing 82 persons and injuring 69. October epidemic of Spanish influenza, which began at the start of the year, kills 1778 persons in one week. The 11th of November, signing of armistice ends the war. Victory celebrations on the Champs-Élysées. The 16th of December, US President Wilson addresses crowds at the Hotel de Ville. <laughs> 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 <laughs>